Checking your exercise progress could be doing something as simple as checking your weight. Ah! Hi everyone and welcome back to Exercise for Health. I'm Richard and today I'm going to be giving you examples of some basic self-assessments that you can do at home so you can use the results as a benchmark to then monitor your progress over the coming weeks when you do the assessments again. If you're new to this channel, we offer tips, advice and exercises each week to help you manage your health condition with physical activity. So go ahead and tap the subscribe button below and the bell icon if you want to be notified of when we upload a new video. So last week we looked at SMART goals to help you with setting realistic aims for your health and fitness. And if you haven't seen that one yet, then click on the pop-out banner above my head to go to that one first. But I thought I would follow that one up with a provision of different methods of assessment so you can see how well you're doing over the coming weeks and months. Because otherwise, how will you know that your new exercise routine is actually working? Now, before we go through them, you don't have to do all of these, just pick those that are relevant to your goal and or your health condition. In addition, you wouldn't conduct these assessments too frequently due to many variables that can also affect them. Taking these assessments every four to six weeks would be good practice for monitoring your progress and to help you maintain your motivation and exercise adherence. There will be some assessments that might be worth investing in some equipment to help you monitor your physical changes. And a good example here is a blood pressure monitor to keep your blood pressure readings in check if your goal is to lower it. However, I'm going to run through assessments that you can do at home without any specialist equipment and using things that you've probably got around your home. So let's get straight into it. So with weight loss, you will need a set of bathroom scales which many people seem to have at home nowadays. If the number you see on your scales is more important to you than what you see in the mirror, then checking your weight might be something that you should consider. Here are some tips with taking your body weight. Number one. Take it on the same day of the week and at the same time of the day and wearing the same type of clothing. This will ensure that you reduce the likelihood of these variables affecting your reading. Number two, make sure your scales are kept in the same room and ideally on a hard floor type rather than a carpet for a more accurate reading. And number three, don't take your weight too frequently. So many people become obsessed with checking their weight, sometimes as much as two or three times a day. Taking your weight too frequently can have a detrimental effect on motivation, especially if the number goes the wrong way. So ideally, aim for a once every four weeks weigh-in to chart your progress, and remember the weigh-in scales don't tell you how fat or thin you are, just what force you're exerting on the planet. A lot of clients I have seen that started an exercise plan find that their weight can fluctuate quite considerably initially, as bones and muscles increase in density, while fat tissue decreases in density, and this can lead to a static weight. So please don't get put off if you don't see the results you want straight away. If you're monitoring your weight, then you can also monitor your body mass index or BMI, as the only other measurement you need is your height. You can take your height using a simple DIY tape measure with someone else's help, and some smartphones now come with an app where it works out your height for you using your phone's camera. Now you will need your height in meters and your weight in kilograms to then work out your BMI. So let me give you an example. My height is 183 centimeters or 1.83 meters and my body weight is a post Christmas 103 kilograms. To work out my BMI, I need to use the equation weight divided by height squared. So if I put my numbers into this equation, this will be 103 on the top divided by 1.83 times 1.83 on the bottom. So now my BMI equals 103 divided by 3.35, which gives me 30.7, and that's my BMI number. To know what this means, I can use this chart to see where I am now, and obviously as my weight comes down, then my BMI number will also fall, as my height is not likely to change much. And this will bring me down into a category that's better for my health. So if your shape is more important to you than your weight or BMI, then it's good practice to take a waist and hip measurement as the ratio between the two can affect our health and can also be an indicator towards a precursor to diabetes. I also believe that this is a much better indicator of health over weight and BMI. To do this, you can use a flexible or tailor's tape measure, but if you don't have this, then a length of string, a marker pen and a ruler will also suffice. In addition, take off any bulky items of clothing. So although you don't have to do these on the skin, you can do it over a light t-shirt for the waist, 
but also remember to do exactly the same when you come to take it again for consistency and improved accuracy. Also take out anything from your pockets or your trousers or shorts as this will affect the hip measurement. To take the waist measurement, you need to find the gap between your bottom rib and the top of your pelvis. This gap can vary from person to person, but the waist clinically is the midway point between those two points. For some people, it may also be in line with their belly button, but don't use this as a reference point. When taking the measurement, it's important that the string or tape measure is level all the way around, and if using a tape measure, ensure it's not twisted. Once you've taken it around your waist, stand upright and breathe naturally and relax so as not to suck your tummy in or push it out. Take off the slack and then you can take the measurement directly from this point if you have the tape measure. Or if you're using some string, mark a line where the start and end meets it. Notice I've also marked the end of the string that I started from so you have two marked points. If you have used the string, you can then now use the ruler to find the length from the marked start end to the marked point on the string. Having two mark points will save confusion over which end you started your measurement from. To take the hip measurement, you follow the same principles as the waist, only this time to find your hip, raise one knee slightly until you feel the kink or bend in the front of your hip. This is the level that you need to take the measurement from. Again, ensure it's level all the way around and as with the waist, you can take the measurement directly with the tape. If you're using the string again, it's probably worth using a different color marker pen to the previous measurement so you know which marked point to measure on the ruler. You should now have two measurements that you've recorded. Ideally for our health, our waist measurement should be less than 94 centimeters or 37 inches for men and 80 centimeters or 31 and a half inches for women. You will be at a higher risk of developing serious health conditions if your waist exceeds 102 centimeters or 40 inches for men and 88 centimeters or 34 and a half inches for women. This is because your risk of some health problems is affected by where you store your body fat. And the only skeletal structure around the waist is the spine, so this cannot affect the actual result. You can use your two results to work out your waist to hip ratio, another indicator of your health, by dividing your waist measurement by your hip measurement, as I'm showing here on the screen. The chart also shows you what your health risk is depending on your result. And again, there is a column for men and one for women as the parameters are slightly different. A very simple way of monitoring your fitness progress is to use the rest and heart rate. Although this won't be as accurate as a full VO2 max test or multi-stage fitness test, it can be a quick and easy way to check improvements over a period of time. To measure this, it's best if you've been sat down for about five to 10 minutes in a relaxed manner with no stimulation from external sources, such as a recent cup of coffee or the TV on or interacting with your phone or computer. To find your pulse, you're going to use the radio artery located on the underside of the wrist on the thumb side. Use your first two index fingers to gently press on this point to feel the pulse. Once you've found it, you then need to count the number of beats you feel in a 15 second time frame. At the end of this time frame, you'll need to multiply your result by four to give you your beats per minute. A typical rest and heart rate will be between 60 and 80 beats per minute. Some medications for certain heart conditions, such as beta blockers, can also affect this. So if you are prescribed this, you may see a lower heart rate in the 50s. Also, people suffering with stress or anxiety might see a higher rest and heart rate, maybe in the 90s. However, as your fitness improves, you'll see a drop in your heart rate at rest as your heart becomes more efficient at pumping blood around the body. In addition, some measurements may be psychological in terms of how you feel. So you can always use a line scale of zero to 10 to answer on your own question. For example, as I'm showing you here, asking yourself how much energy do you feel that you have day to day by marking on the line on the scale of zero to 10, where 10 is lots of energy. Mark a cross on the line with the date above it and then ask yourself the same question after a period of time exercising regularly like four to six weeks and see if your response is any different. There are many other assessments that you can do for more specific conditions, such as a 30 second sit to stand test or a six minute walk test for breathing and fitness, a timed up and go for neurological conditions, and I'll cover these in a future video. So make sure you're subscribed to get notified. I hope you can take something away from this video today. If so, please give it a like by clicking the thumbs up button below to help this channel grow so more people can benefit from watching these videos. And remember to stay active, keep moving, and I'll see you next week. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video today, please give it a thumbs up. 
You can also click here to subscribe to this channel or click here to watch a recent video. See you soon.